Okay, we are here with bassist Ed Fuquay, and Ed is performing with his all-star trio on Friday of August 10th at Espresso 77, 9 p.m., and Ed will have with him saxophonist Jed Levy and drummer Jeff Brillinger, and we're going to hear a little bit about what to expect later on. Right now, we want to ask Ed a few questions, kind of delve into things a little bit. Thanks for joining us, Ed. Glad to be here. Ed, can you just tell us a little bit about when you came to choose jazz or when you fell in love with jazz and realized that that was going to be uh, your direction musically? Well, I, I got into music probably the same way so many of us did, is just uh, uh, playing electric bass guitar um, in high school, um, rock bands, you know, the, the stage band, uh, uh, which was, you know, basically the jazz ensemble, except you didn't have any supporting classes for it, um, and played in, in bad fusion bands. Uh, through college, uh, and it was then that I ran into um, a guitar player who's uh, still a very good friend of mine, um, Matt Whittington, who fell by a club that I was playing, and we started hanging out, and he asked me out of the blue if I'd ever heard any Clifford Brown, and of course I hadn't at that point. Um, so one night after after the gig, uh, you know, we fell by his place. Um, uh, he played uh, a Clifford Brown uh, record off MRC, uh, Clifford doing Stella by Starlight, and um, just that, that changed my life. Uh, I, I still was playing primarily bass guitar and uh, uh, ended up going to Berkeley College of Music for um, a couple of years. Uh, and playing more and more straight ahead, mainstreamish kind of jazz. Um, uh, that's where I started playing a lot of double bass. Um, and when I moved to New York in 1987, I was still doubling, but um, probably about four or five years after that, um, I really just started hearing uh, uh, double bass as, as, as my voice. Um, right. um, and. Uh, sold the last electric bass I, I owned at that point in time mm -hmm. and have been playing the double bass exclusively ever since. That's great. That actually answers the second question, which <laughs> was, how did you choose your instrument? So I think, I think that you, you mentioned that. Yeah, it, it, uh, I was visiting a friend of mine who was going to Berkeley College of Music at the time, uh, just out of high school and first year of college. And we were listening to a Flora Porim record uh, called Stories to Tell, and Ron Carter is on that record. Um, and that, there was something just about that time, that record, when I heard it, um, that really put the, the, that sound in my ear. And I started really wanting to explore how I could make that sound myself. Um, and uh, another record from around that time that I listened to that, that uh, uh, you know, just sort of propelled me down that path again. Uh, it, it was again bassist Ron Carter. Um, uh, a great record, uh, Rossan, Roland Kirk, uh, and Al Hibbler called A Meeting of the Times. And there's an intro um, that's uh, uh, just Ron and O.C. Johnson um, uh, to the Duke Ellington tune, Do Nothing Till You Hear From Me, that just, um, you know, grabbed me by the pit of my stomach. It was just, mm. it was the, you know, I want to do that, that's <laughs> what I want to do. Um, so that, that, that uh, you know, that kind of uh, pushed me along that path, but, you know, when I got to New York, there, there are so many really wonderful musicians up here. Um, there are a lot of, very, very, very good bass guitarists, electric bass guitarists. And um, I didn't need to be a, a mediocre one. Um, that plus, you know, just hearing more and more um, 
the acoustic sound of double bass as my voice. Um, you know, really made that decision for me very easy just to, to you know, commit myself to this, the, this specific instrument. Excellent. Um, you've already mentioned probably three different albums that uh, in one way or another had some effect on you. Is it possible maybe to narrow down to one like desert island disc, as they say? Um, Is there something that touches you every single time from beginning to end? It's, it's your go-to record. Um, I, I, I would have to say not really. I mean, there, there, are, there are so many great records. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time... Um, as I was coming up through the whole uh, 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 number of releases of the Red Garland Trio with Paul mm -hmm. Chambers and Art Taylor, um, you know, one record in particular there is a record called Groovy. Um, you know, and Paul, Paul and Art just sound so great on that. Um, there's another record that I did not hear until um, I was living in New York and was studying with. Um, uh, bassist that I spent 14 years with, um, Joe Solomon. He played um, a trio record, uh, Lee Konitz, Sonny Dallas, and Elvin Jones. The record's called Motion. Um, and they're... Sonny Dallas just has the, the most wonderful quarter note line on there. Uh, it's, 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 it's like he's playing a melody all the time, except it's all quarter notes and it's all constant chord notes but it is um it's like he's just back behind the saxophone singing hmm. um that's a name i don't know uh he uh, was um a bassist on the scene here in new york for uh, a long time uh late 50s early 60s he played with lenny tristano and that group of people warren marsh lee konitz um the 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 record motion uh, uh, as I said, Lee Konitz, uh, Sonny Dallas, and, and uh, 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 Elvin Jones. Uh, there's a Paul Kinnishet record that he's on. Um, hmm. uh, he was teaching out in Long Island for a, a long time. I, I only got to meet him once, and I had a, a very <laughs> humbling telephone conversation with him um, uh, once. Uh, he was... Uh, just part of the milieu uh, of uh, uh, people who had played and worked and studied with uh, Lenny Tristano and Sal Mosca uh, that I became acquainted with through studying with Joe, who also studied with Lenny and, and Sal Mosca. So. Excellent. And could you talk about um, a teacher or mentor that you feel probably had uh, a pivotal effect on you or, or the most uh, the strongest effect on you as a as a musician. Well, you know, it's it's again, it's going to be four people. Um, you know, all at uh, kind of different stages of your life, they put put propel you along your path. Um, when I was in high school, uh, the the band director John Bradley, you know, was responsible for um, uh, making sure I knew how to read, exposing me to the the jazz idiom. Um, uh, as I said, my buddy Matt Whittington, um, really kind of reinforcing a more mainstream and uh, 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 an awareness of the tradition of the music. Um, another uh, uh, bassist from uh, uh, Georgia where I was living, uh, Tommy Gully, um, who just uh, was a, the greatest guy, um, you know, would do whatever he could to facilitate the performance of the listening of jazz, whether it was bringing records, whether it was sitting in the audience, whether it was being on the stand playing, um, whether it was uh, trying to get an organization together to bring music in, into um, our, our region. Um, but, you know, just a, a, a really wonderful human being. Um, and then Joe Solomon, once I got up here, you know, it's, it's when I got to New York, as I said, the, you know, the, there were so many really great musicians and I could hear them playing with um, all of this meaning and intent in their music and I I didn't know how to get there 
um, all of my studies up to the point that got me to New York um, got me to a place where I could sound like I could play, but um, the ability to um, convey meaning in your playing, to play with such intent that you could just tell that they were trying to communicate something to you. I had no idea how to get there, and it was um, um, a, a very frustrating experience trying to, you know, uh, uh, approach it from a, a, a gathering more vocabulary. You know, it's like, okay, I want to write poetry, so I need to uh, look in the dictionary and learn more words. That's not it at all. And so that was the thing that Joe Solomon did for me was, um, you know, first you have to believe that you have a voice within you, that that voice is meaningful, that it's yours. And um, then how do you get the skill sets to understand what you're hearing, um, to know where what you're hearing is on your instrument, and um, you know, to have the ability to, you know, even with a very simple vocabulary, play with meaning, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, that cat is funny, and the antics of that juvenile feline both mean the same thing, you know, but it's, it's, it's not about large words, small words, it's about using the language that you have the most nuanced control over to convey the meaning that you have. Um, you know, they're just, as I keep saying, there are a lot of great players in the city, and um, I don't have the harmonic vocabulary that a lot of them do. Um, what I think I do have is um, a very personal voice, um, and I like to think that I can use that to convey how I'm hearing the music that I'm involved with to everybody. Fantastic, thank you. And lastly, could you tell us a little bit about what you love about Jackson Heights and performing in Jackson Heights, what that means to you in general? Um, we moved here 16, almost 17 years ago now. Um, and just the ability to walk down the street and hear so many different languages, so much different music, um, you know, it all, it all feeds your, your internal picture of what the world is. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, not that I want to, um, you know, uh, be able to play Kuali music, but, you know, having an exposure to Kuali and, and, you know, having that sound kind of roll around in my head while I'm, you know, hearing Have You Met Miss Jones, mm -hmm. you know, it's like that, that comes out. Um, it's uh, uh, being sort of uh, 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 interested in architecture, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I have always enjoyed the, the architecture of the neighborhood. Um, uh, there are just some really great buildings, um, you know, both the, the, the larger apartment buildings and uh, smaller semi-attached housing. Um, the food, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's been an extremely comfortable place to live. It's been a very friendly place to live, too. Uh, we moved here from Brooklyn after living in Brooklyn for 15 years. And uh, we were walking around the neighborhood, you know, just going to open houses, uh, you know, trying to find an apartment. And uh, uh, we ran into a, a woman on the street um, walking her dog, you know. So we stopped and said hello to the dog. And so she asked us if we lived in the neighborhood. We said no, but we were, you know, we were having to move out of our old neighborhood and we were looking for a place. And she said, oh, well, I'm not selling, but you should come up and look at our apart you know, my apartment because, uh, you, you know, that way you'll know what uh, apartments in these buildings look like. And, you know, nobody in Brooklyn had ever invited me into their apartment if they didn't <laughs> know me. Um, so that, that sort of struck us um, in a very positive note. Um, I know uh, my wife, Kate, when um, we were thinking about moving here, um, you know, one of the things that she would do was come to the neighborhood um, 
in various times of the day, uh, evening and night, and you know, just look around and talk to people. And you know, everybody was very friendly. Everybody seemed like they enjoyed living here. Um, so it was a very easy decision for us to, to, to move here. Excellent. Ed Fuquay, thank you so much for, for talking with us. Sure. Hope everybody can come down um, Friday, August 10th to yeah, tell Espresso us about 77. It. Um, uh, Jeff Brillinger, uh, the drummer on the gig, he and I have been playing together for probably 13 years, 14 years now. Um, uh, in a, in a variety of ensembles, but he's uh, just a, a really wonderful player with a deep, deep background. Uh, Jed Levy and I have been playing together probably for about three or four years now on a, on a fairly regular basis. Um, and he is um, uh, just scary good. Um, uh, a, a very, very, both these guys just have such a deep, feeling for the music and um, uh, you know such a joy in playing um, you know we had a great time last year with uh, 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 Pete Zimmer who I had played with fairly infrequently but had played with a little bit before um, and Javier Arau who um, I actually I think that was the second time we had played together <laughs> um, was at that gig um, and you know that, that was a great experience um, I think the thing that will be different um, here is just the fact that uh, you know there, there's uh, so much more shared experience that the three of us have as musicians, um, and um, you know that kind of camaraderie. Um, that's the great line uh, that Jim Hall. Somebody asked him, um, "How did he define the swing feel?" And that's what he said: camaraderie. It's not about time. It's not about tempo. It's not about beat. It's about playing together and I think that's one of the things that um, you know we're hoping to convey is just the, the, the joy that we have in playing together. Absolutely. Ed Fuquay, thank you so much. Thanks Jim. We're talking about Friday, August 10th, 9 p.m. Espresso 77, Ed Fuquay, Jed Levy, and Jeff Brillinger, all part of the Jackson Heights Jazz Festival 2018. See you there. See you there.